This morning, that to uh, host and have back with us today the the, the Eucharist Canon Ann Hallmark and her husband. So it's always great to have them uh, here with us to celebrate. Um, I want to draw your attention to some of the announcements in the bulletin on the back page, <clears throat> inside the back cover. Uh, today's annual meeting of the Vestry and the Father of Board will occur today after church. That's an annual requirement that we all have. I won't go through all these, but there's lots going on. Bible study, becoming the beloved community, understanding systematic uh, racism on Wednesdays. And uh, I'll just let you read through those. It's a little pretty self explanatory. The discernment communicates a vestry and update during our uh, monthly meeting this, this month, like it was earlier this week. Uh, they, the, the discernment committee is meeting every two weeks, and if they finish their colic, and they're working on the parish profile, which of course we want you to input on. As soon as it's ready, the draft is ready for you to look at. And we'll get that out to everybody and we want your comments. And this is all, this is not just the sermon committee or the vestry choosing our next rector. It is this parish that will do that. Um, any, oh, one more. The flowers are given uh, today 
in honor of Our Lady of Walsingham, whose feast day it is today. That, that was new to me. <laughs> so I'll have to put that down and remember that for next year. Any other announcements that uh, we need to let people know about? Okay, well, welcome once again to St. Philip's, and I um, hope you enjoy the uh, celebration this morning.
as sisters and brothers. Help us to overcome the scandal of poverty, the fixed chasm of indifference, and to recognize you in the wounded poor. Through Jesus Christ, the builder of bridges. Amen. Amen. You see it? <laughs> Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamal, son of your uncle, Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is Anathoth, for the right of redemption by your purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamal came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, seventeen shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard, in their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Amen. We will now read Psalm 91 responsibly by whole verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High <laughs> abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. He shall cover you with his wings, and you shall find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness shall be a shield from our heart. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. Of the plague that stops in the darkness, nor of the sickness that lays waste at midday. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. He shall fall upon me, and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble, and I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our second reading is a reading from the first letter to Timothy. <clears throat> there is great pain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. 
But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of your faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one else has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that is really life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm not sure who my head person is. Is it you, Terry? Yeah. Am I in the right spot? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, perfect. Preaching out of different places every Sunday. <laughs> so like, oh, I got my heart. For those of you who have not had a chance to introduce myself to, I am Ann Palmer. I have the joy and privilege of serving 16 congregations of the Diocese of Western Michigan in the northern area. We've we divided the diocese of three. And so I get the wrong. I get the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray on y'all all the time. I also want to just take a moment and thank Mike for the announcement he made to you. That's exactly the kind of information that I think helps reduce people's anxiety about transition time. So um, yeah, Mike, thank you. Uh, and if you've got questions, please ask them. Talk to them. And also to Joey. Richard, hi, yeah, here's Joey, who is, I believe, chairing yes. the committee in this uh, discernment thing. And I want to say a word, too, about discernment. A spiritual activity. <coughs> There's, it's very easy to confuse looking for a record with finding a job candidate and you know, getting hold of them. At any time, but especially at a time when we have more openings than we have clergy, anxiety and trying to get someone to fill the position doesn't produce the results that we're looking for. What we're looking for is a genuine reading of the congregation and the clergy person to be with one another for the next phase of both the journey of both the clergyman and, and a, a woman and the congregation. And I just want to say to you, I people have asked me, well, aren't you nervous about this? I'm like, well, I see that something like half a dozen clergy during COVID. I think we're going to be okay. Do I have a time frame? No. But knowing the work that you all are doing, um, praying with you daily, knowing that you're being prayed for in the diocese, it's going to work out. Don't, don't know when, don't know how, do know that it will work out. So let me turn then to the readings. Uh, actually, Larry, did you pick this first thing? Or where did that Okay. Uh, so, um, here you go. So I, I was looking at the text of this first hymn thinking, you know, maybe we just read this and that's, that's the sermon because this is so on point. This is so on point. Um, you know, shame, oh shame to us who rest content while lust and greed for gain in street and shop and tenement bring gold of human pain. I don't know about you, but I just finished reading American Cartel, which is about the conspiracy, whether stated or not, among drug manufacturers, drug distributors, uh, pharmacies, and doctors to create an opioid epi epidemic that is completely disrupted. I can't, I can't quote you the, the uh, statistics right now, but the, the destruction that has been wrought by greed my own conviction that the, what fuels the greed is fear. People do not experience how beloved they are of God. And because they don't experience that, they try for other things, for things, to help them to assuage that pain that they're feeling, that emptiness, however, however it is they're experiencing it. So, I think all of us have something to gain from considering these readings, and I, I will probably not do as much about them as I, uh, as I might if I were teaching a class, but I will say that the reading from Jeremiah is a reading about hope. And, as is so often the case in the Jewish scriptures, it's hope in the midst of desperate circumstances. I don't know if you put it from the text itself, but Jeremiah is not only in a city that's under siege, completely surrounded by enemies, uh, he's also in the guardhouse in the king's palace. So he's in jail in a siege. And the word of the Lord comes to him. 
and says, hey, this is what I want you to do. This is, this is what's going to happen. Your cousin's going to come. He's going to offer you this land to buy. I want you to do that. And that's the way it works out. So it's so often the case in our um, ancestors in the faith, they are pointing to hope in the midst of scary stuff, in the midst of really frightening times. Um, and then we have the delightful last uh, three verses of the, well, the psalm is quite wonderful, 91 wonderful psalm, but the last three verses in particular are considered to be God speaking to the people. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver you. So there's a message, let us join you, isn't there, at least in those two readings, about God with us in the midst of circumstances, wherever they are. And then, of course, the real lovely conversation or instruction from Paul to Timothy about how you're supposed to operate. Don't, don't be seduced by the worldly things. Because remember, it's not money that's the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. See, aforementioned there in the uh, American cartel. And he tried, he, I love what he says here, that in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now we look at the super, super wealthy and think, well, they're fine. No, I don't think they are. I really don't think they are. Because unless they're engaged actively in acts of generosity, in acts of encouraging people, in acts of supporting people, I think they're trying to feed a hungry world. I think they're desperate. And frankly, I'm sorry for them. Genuinely. And then we have this famous gospel that we've heard a bazillion times. Well, maybe not a bazillion, half a bazillion times. <laughs> About the rich man dressed in purple and fine linen. He feasted sumptuously every day. By contrast, a poor man named Lazarus. And one of the commentaries I was reading said, that it was the case in Israel, it's probably in other places, that at the gate of the house, you know, the houses where you were surrounded with people by walls, um, fairly high walls, and there would be a single entrance in and out. And at the gate of that house, I'm always imagining it's on the right as you come out, I hear it come out of the house or out of the gate, there would be a bench. And that bench was the place where people who were in need would sit. And they would sit and wait for people coming or going from the house to ask for help. Yep. I had not known about that. They, although the, the picture <coughs> in, the, in the, um, you know, the gospel is, is more than that. It's, it's laid uh, at the gate. They could have been laying on the bench, but whatever. That was the customary place for people in need to be seeking assistance. Right there, the gate of the home of people who had, arguably, assistance to offer. And there's a way in which the rich man, if you look at this, is not painted as a completely horrible person. If you look at him, he's gone, he's, yes, he's, he's selfishly asking Father Abraham, who is renowned for his generosity and his hospitality in the tradition, He's asking Father Abraham to send Lazarus on an errand. That's kind of creepy. On one hand. On the other hand, when Father Abraham says, no way, Val, it's not happening, he says, well, then warn my brothers. So even though he's in agony, he's not so completely self-obsessed that he doesn't think he's failing. But I gotta tell you, the question really for me and, and I, you know, of course, there's the famous last line, they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I have to tell you, I spent, I can't tell you how long digging around trying to find that out if Luke added that to the story. Because it's such a, uh, he didn't believe in it. He didn't believe in uh, 
Moses and the prophets, you, you're not believing in me. You know, I see you. Couldn't find anybody to back me up on that. But anyway. <laughs> what it did get me to thinking about this really vivid story is that gate came out of the home, the nice house, and that bench. And he's sitting there. People who didn't know. And it got me to thinking not about the kind of help that we're accustomed to offering. I mean, we, we give our donations, we uh, work in the food pantry, the baby pantry, we do those things that we see, you know, the, the garden. We do those things that we see to help. We see to do to help. It got me wondering <coughs> who am I not seeing? Who am I walking past and not seeing or hearing? And I will tell you frankly, um, I would have said that I was fairly liberal, fairly attentive to the people around me. But the call of the Episcopal Church for us to engage in conversations about racism and about how pervasive it is and has been, and what more is still needed, not only to address the way that our black brothers and sisters, but our Asian and Latin and uh, Native folk have been treated. That has done more to open my eyes, and I would have told you they were open. I would have told you that I saw the people sitting next to my group, but I'm learning through brilliant conversation with wonderful people, no, there's a lot I didn't see. There's a lot I was blind to. So if there's a convicting question, my brothers and sisters, that I would raise with you, it is what, who, not just what, but who might we actually be walking past? Who might we not see as you go? Who are you not attending to? I'm not asking you to give an answer right now. I'm just asking you to ponder that as a serious question. Because I'm reasonably certain you will discover that maybe there are some folks you haven't noticed sitting right there people for whom something fleeting in passing might be a gift to them in their day. I had a very modest experience that I'll share with you um, as I was getting into this conversation and the clergy in the northern region <coughs> have their own sacred ground circle. There are sacred ground circles being established. These are conversation circles, getting people not so much to get a new degree or another certificate, but to get them to really turn and face their lives and face the lives of their brothers and sisters of all sorts of races. Um, so that had raised my awareness enough that as I was walking out of a pub that I really, really liked in downtown uh, Traverse City, I noticed a man coming forward with black, he was pretty much in black, but he had a chef's apron on. And he was black. And it hadn't occurred, I never would have done this before these studies, but I looked at him and I said, oh, are you coming in here? And he looked at me and said, yes, I am. And I held the door for him. And the look on his face was fleeting, but it looked to me as though he was pleased. As though I offered him something he'd not been offered before. A word of greeting. A gesture of kindness. So my prayer for all of us, as we make our way through this season of Pentecost, I think I've advanced my theory of the church year here. I'm not sure I'll be here in that. Uh, that the church year is, for me, divides in half. And from first Sunday of Advent through Pentecost, 
The church is offering us a story that has us figured out. It is offering us the events and festivals that draw us together in faith. So the first Sunday after Pentecost until the last Sunday after Pentecost, almost half a year here at Calvary, we're being invited to practice what it is that we've just been taught about the miraculous event of God present to us all the time. We may not be present all the time. So my prayer for us is we make our way more deeply into the practice of our faith, into the details of daily life, if you will. And so we find ourselves opening up to more possibilities than we yet imagined possible. I assure you, we're being here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, specifically for Joe, our president, and Gretchen, our governor. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the greatness of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop. Prince, Bishop Provisional for Eastern and Western Michigan. For our paradises and their bishops, Bonnie, Bishop of Michigan, Rayford, Bishop of Northern Michigan, Moises, Bishop of the Dominican Republic, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Craig, 
Bishop of the Northwest Lower Michigan Synod of the ELCA. We pray for all bishops and other ministers. We pray for all those in our diocese who are discerning calls to ministry, both lay and ordained. In particular, we pray for those in our diocese who are preparing for the sacred order of priests, including Jonathan, Alicia, Barrett, Alex, Derek, Matt, Joanna, Kurt, and Anne Marie. We pray also for those in our diocese who are preparing for the sacred order of deacons, including Elizabeth, Joy, and Linda. May God bless them with wisdom, courage, and empathy as they serve all, especially the poor. We're all concerned about our church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, in our prayer cycle of prayers, we remember our visiting priest for this Sunday, the Reverend Canon Ann Hallmark. Our vestry and their officers, Mike, Wendy, Barb, Joy, Susan, Harold, BJ, and Denise. Our delegates and alternates to diocesan convention, Mike, Joy, Wendy, and Nancy. Pray that they will have the wisdom to build on the past and courage to lead us into a bright future. We also pray for our Rector Discernment Committee, Alice Matson, Debbie Clark, Judy and Rob Meyer, Barb A. Kelly, Joni Carlson, Harold Byers, and Tim Foster. Hear us, Lord. For all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God, in our prayer cycle of prayers, we lift up Pete and Linda Agar, Tom and Edith Fletcher, the families we serve at the baby pantry, and all who use this space to bring about beauty and healing in your world. Pray that they may find and be found by God. We also pray for the mission and ministry of Grace Standish, Deborah Schoenborn, Senior Warden, St. Francis of Assisi, Shelbyville, Mike Wood, Priest in Charge. For those in need of healing, especially Blanche, Dorothy, Carol, Joanne, Arlene, Barbara, Susan, Preston, Frank, Mark, Elmer, Dave, Don, Barb, Maggie, Tom, Ruth, Chris, Matt, Harold, Rebecca, Judy, and all whose lives have been affected by COVID and all of those who have asked for our prayers. We give God thanks for those celebrated birthdays and anniversaries this week. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant, Nancy Simmons, as she begins another year. We also thank you for the love and witness of those beginning another year of married life, Dave and Denise Clayson. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, especially Robert Wallace, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We pray for peace in the world. Help leaders of all the countries to make good decisions. Help us all to learn to live together and to try to understand each other, even though we may seem very different from each other. Remind us when we forget that we are all your children who share this earthly home. Help us to live in peace and harmony. Almighty God, our Savior and Protector, we humbly seek your loving wisdom and goodwill for the discernment committee of St. Philip, while we undertake the process to call our next rector. We ask that you direct us, O Lord, in all our doings and assist and guide our committee in the search for our next rector, whom we do not yet know, Grant us, in all our doubts and uncertainties, the grace to ask what you would have us to do, that the spirit of wisdom may direct us to wise choices. We beseech you, O Lord, to guide the hearts of all prospective rectors in hearing the call to serve St. Philip's, and lead them forward in wise discernment and grace to listen and follow your guidance, should one be called to bless us with their presence. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them, we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, 
Remembering now the work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate the death and resurrection as we await the day of the Son. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Mary, Tabitha, and Mary. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hands at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. But the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. The risen Lord be known to us in the reign of the dead. Accept his prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. 
brothers and sisters, we serve a loving God and therefore are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
for those praying from home, but I want to invite all of us to pray that prayer of spiritual communion with folks who are viewing us online. In your name, blessed be Jesus, who the faithful gathered at every altar of the church, where your blessed body and blood are offered to save, and remember your children of the marriage and those who are in your marriage. I will not offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace.
Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.